introduce all of you, but I already forgot your names. So I'm just going to let you introduce yourselves uh, because I know you have this all down. So yeah, let's have some fun with our contesting panel. We will try to make it as exciting as possible to not stop you from your drinks. Because we know it's four o'clock and it's almost five. Um, my name is Elizabeth Ramirez and I am the manager of community operations at Cobalt.io. We are contesting as a service. And I am lucky enough to have worked with each of these contesters, humans, um, throughout a few years now. So I will hand it over, Andrea. Thank you. Uh, I'm Sally Rosa. I am the manager of the cybersecurity services at Google. Uh, I'm Vanessa Sauter, and I'm a security strategist at Gong.io, um, and also a Google. So we're going to start off by asking these lovely humans how they got started. Um, you know, what's the how, what's the why, and why you're doing pen testing. Vanessa? And please keep in mind, since we don't have the mics and everything, it is a little bit, so try to speak up as much as you can. And please raise your hand in the back if you can't hear us, we'll use the mic. Um, cool, yeah, so three years ago I was actually working for Cobalt full-time on their community team, and they were launching a new assessment uh, to screen candidates for the contesting community. Uh, uh, yeah, so they were uh, they were launching a new assessment to screen candidates, and um, I had loved just kind of like poking around and hacking on my own, and so I was like, "Can you just send it to me?" And I passed it, and then um, I just <laughs> started um, hacking with that. So it's been it's been three years now. It's been pretty awesome. You don't have to hold the mic that <laughs> okay. uh, so I studied computer science, wanted to actually be a developer in the beginning. Uh, then I did some pen testing for six years and I decided I didn't really like it just because it was kind of repetitive and everything. But uh, so from there, I my husband asked me what I wanted to do and I did some hacking, you know, in high school, you know, sub seven or whatever. So I just decided to pursue it and uh, luckily, you know, there's a company uh, Rapid7 at the time that had a security program and basically they were taking people that had different backgrounds and teaching them how to do pen testing. So I was part of that program. Uh, so I've been doing pen testing now for seven years. So it's, yeah, it's different and I love it. So if we can take a pause, I'd actually love for you to share about the Rapid7 program because as people here are actually trying to get into pen testing, I think this is one of the avenues that you can actually share about. Yeah, so when I started, it was the analyst program, so basically it was, um, like I said, people from different backgrounds, so in my case it was software uh, testing, some people were blue teams, some people were developers, and basically trying to get in. Uh, so it was more like a mentorship program, and, uh, but now they pivoted and they have this program called Associates, so basically it's uh, a Kind of like an internship, but it's a rotational. Uh, so you do six months of pen testing, six months of incident response, and then six months of advisory services. So, and then at the end, they kind of let you choose what department you want to work in. Uh, so basically, you get like the full spectrum of security and kind of decide what you like. So it's definitely something really interesting. And part of the question is, okay. Yes, you do be okay. So please make note of that, everybody. Uh, I think it's really important that you know, as people try to learn, you find things that are paying you while you learn. Learning and learning, right? Like it's super important. So definitely look into that. He said I will be for so good after this talk and chat more with you about it. But would love to hear what you do in your day to day on there. In your day to day. So in your day. Uh, so um, I. Uh, okay. So, uh, besides my uh, day job, I also have a full time job. Um, so, I'm doing a lot of things in the various areas, such as web, API, extended and data networks. I'm also doing mobile and doing cloud configuration assessments. Um, I can also do a customer design review and do my own as well. Um, for Cobalt, um, I specialize in banking uh, methods, and so on, and so on. 
So what would you say really helps you be successful as a pen tester? In your day to day or you know, just in working in security, you know, you're at Gong, which is a huge company. Um, so in your day to day, what do you think is the most exciting thing about being a pen tester or being just in the field? Um, okay, so yeah, my, my day to day is not in pen testing. And I I represent Gong for security and privacy and legal reviews, and I think it's really useful to come in with an attacker's mindset, not necessarily when I'm working with our partners and, and helping them negotiate and figure out um, you know, what's a healthy security partnership, but an understanding from their perspective, like what are the threats that they're seeing and what are the different ways in which they're assessing risk that I understand um, being a pen tester and doing Baghdadi. And so it's really useful for me at least when I, I'm able to come in and have calls um, with folks who are trying to figure out, like, hey, what is this, you know, what is your OAuth implementation, or what is your encryption method, or, you know, what what is this thing that I'm noticing um, in the implementation? And, and I can not only give them the facts about sort of how I gone, we help them enforce that and help them implement it, but also, like, why they're asking those questions in the first place, and why it's important from an exploitation perspective to know um, what the risks are. And so it's kind of a cool blend of both and just also being able to take a look at product features and be able to do internal threat modeling and working so closely with my other colleagues who are fantastic at their jobs uh, to say like, hey, uh, you know, have you thought about it from this perspective? Because as someone who does pen testing, you know, I'm going to see something from an attacker perspective um, but my colleague who is, you know, a developer or um, who's focusing on IR, you know, might see it differently. And so if we can, like, kind of blend, I think it's it's just an awesome partnership and awesome teamwork. So I'm going to pivot a little bit um, on something you brought up, bug bounty versus pen testing. You said that? You want to take oh, that? I have something to say. Well, I have something to say. So I think it's important to, like, like, we talk about the attack mindset, but I think it's just being curious, right? You need to like be curious and then try to learn more stuff. Like you don't have to, especially in pen testing, like you're not gonna be an expert in anything. It's like it's so broad that you can't just be an expert at pen testing, right? Like you have to specialize in something. But also use your current skills and like for example I came from software testing, right? So I found that software testing and security testing is actually very common. It's just thinking about uh, like different, instead of finding vulnerabilities, well, instead of finding bugs, we're finding vulnerabilities and just trying to implement that and bring a different perspective. Like, I think that's kind of what helped me be successful was that maybe I didn't have that security background to begin with, but I brought a different, uh, a different way of thinking outside of the box, and that's kind of what helped me. And I think, you know, it's not just software testing, it could be routine, it could be like anything. I think bring a different perspective you apply that to your job, basically, to pen testing. So I'll pivot on that one, we can come back to the family, but I'm curious, certs or no certs? So I really don't think that the certifications are required to succeed in the industry, and you can do it without them as well. They are not close to that. I think that more important is the knowledge that you can gain. Um, I personally have a uh, few certifications um, for office security mostly, but um, again, I don't think they are mandatory. You can learn from online resources that are free as well and still be amazing at this level. So uh, I do also have some certifica uh, certifications, but I think it's more of are they really helpful? I think, like you said, right? It's more about the knowledge that you get. But I do think it's important once you start looking for jobs, mostly because sometimes HR just needs a little box to check and it gets you kind of that initial interview. So I think it's just more of, you know, get something that is security related and then try to, you know, use what you learn but also pivot. And I think there's also sometimes, uh, there are certain certifications that are technically beginner but are really hard and I think a lot of people get discouraged when they can't get those certifications because they don't have like endless hours to be studying. 
So, you know, find something that works for you and something that you can actually use to learn the skills that are required. There's a lot of resources, like even uh, Cybersecurity Mentor. Like, these courses are accessible, they're not super expensive, and you're actually learning how to do pen testing. Uh, but, I mean, obviously, it might not compete against OECP, but at least it's a starting point, at least it's something that you can use that knowledge and apply it. Yeah, and I can speak to So in my role, um, I'm doing constant hiring of pen testers, and again, it's not a hard requirement, but it's a nice to have. So, you know, there's some testers that are like, never, I don't need that, I'm legit, I'm not gonna pay you to tell me that I'm awesome. Um, but as she mentioned, it can get your foot in the door. It just depends uh, on the situation. For example, for us, depending on business need, like I might be looking for trust, right? Like that's like UK certification. Uh, I might be looking for the OECP. It just depends on the time of year and like what our business need is. So again, it's nice to have it in your back pocket. I'm not, we're not gonna overlook you if you don't have a cert. Uh, we're probably gonna work more on a referral. It just depends. Um, but again, some awesome, amazing testers are just like, never. Like, I don't need that, right? I'm, I'm too cool. And that's fine. Uh, yeah, you can open the camera for me. Oh, oh right. uh, So I'm really blind as a person, so I'm just going to be direct with y'all. That kind of scares people sometimes. But uh, I'm going to give you the hard truth. It's total bullshit. And I, <laughs> I, I, think they, I think it is one of the worst barriers to entry. I think it is super classist. I think it has absolutely nothing to do with the practical applications um, in the field, and I don't think anyone should be spending the money to get it. Um, the best way that you can learn how to be a hacker is to hack things, and there's plenty of places to do that. You can do public bug bounty, um, you can do sandboxes, you can get certificates of completion, but I would not let anyone tell you that if you don't have a piece of paper, uh, you're not a good hacker or you're not worth it because you are. And those companies are there specifically to get money out of you. And some of them do really fun stuff. Offensive security does, does great stuff. But don't buy into it. Um, I, I think really the only time that you actually need a cert is legit if you need like the CISSP because of uh, you know management requirements and compliance requirements. But so you just hack, and like, it's, it's so bad. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's not um, professional advice, that's just... <laughs> I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a lawyer, and I'm not a tax expert, you know, all the different disclaimers. Um, just have fun and get your hands dirty. So circling back, we mentioned a couple times, just haven't touched upon it, but bounty. Right? So we're talking about pen testing, but is Bug Bounty another space to get you an entree in and or practice for pen, test, for pen testing itself? It's a hard one. Um, so I think 10 years ago Bug Bounty would have been the perfect place. I think right now it's very challenging because what happens is, so I, I used to manage the Bug Bounty pen testing team at Bug Crop. Um, and What's, what happens is like we don't launch programs with bug bounty on bug bounty companies don't launch public programs until they're sufficiently hardened. Right? Like you're not gonna release a program for a fresh target because as a as a customer, right, launching a program, you're gonna be flooded with vulnerabilities and there's just not really gonna be an ROI. So typically what happens is you're gonna release a, a small private bug bounty program with researchers who've already been vetted by that private, by that company, or by the, the bug bounty company. Um, and so when a, when a target goes public, um, you're looking at kind of a, like a, a brown belt or a black belt of bug bounty sometimes. You can get really lucky uh, by scraping assets that are underused or following uh, to see if they're adding new domains. But it's tricky. I think it's a great challenge. I think if you really want to understand um, in practice and iterate in terms of how to hack and what that mindset is, public bug bounty is one of the best places you can do it. Um, but I would not expect, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go into it feeling as if like 
you know, you're going to make a ton of money because you're going to set yourself up for failure. Um, and so that's just, you gotta, you got to be really gritty with it, um, really push through, and I just would never, I would say I would never recommend someone to rely on bug bounty income when they're first starting out um, because it's going to be a little dicey. But then you get, you know, the more bugs are likely to find, which is fun. What would you say, you know, if you're coming, let's say you're, you've been in the bug bounty space and you're now switching over to pen testing under a oh, we, we ticket. Um, yeah, they, you know, if you're coming into a pen testing space, what should you keep in mind? What is the most important to have top of mind to just kind of switch over or maybe, you know, move back and forth between the two? So, um, I would say bug bounty is very different. It's not really pen testing. Uh, so, first of all, we're getting paid for what we do, so there's that. Uh, but also, it's a different mentality, right? It's not just finding well, bugs here and there. It's more about you know training exploits. It's also about giving value to the client. It's also like we want to make sure we give a comprehensive test, right? You don't just want to focus on finding like cross-site scripting or something. You want to make sure everything is covered that the customer is not going to be later you know, have some kind of breach or something. So it's a little bit different in the mentality, just in, like, you're not just finding bugs. There are other uh, benefits for them. The reporting is one of them. And for bug bounty, you know, you just focus on the, on the actual bug. But for pet testing, you also focus on, like, what they actually did that it's actually good. It's not just vulnerability. So it's kind of like, you guys did this protection, like, you put sanitization, so you guys, like, uh, implemented properly and we weren't able to get SQL injection or something. So it's not just focusing on the bad stuff, it's focusing on the whole. Fun facts about any random fun facts about Pentest that you've been on the account that was really interesting and how you got there. A fun finding on the test? Fun finding on the test. Without breaking NDA. Without breaking NDA. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, we all have an NDA, right? <laughs> so recently, it's I mean, it's, it's interesting that it's still out there, but uh, so recently I was doing an IoT test and uh, they had a web application and they had uh, different levels of permissions and I saw that you can log in as an admin by changing a cookie that put admin and basically they give you access to, to everything. So that was pretty interesting. I'm surprised it's still out there, but yeah. Uh, this is super simple hacking one uh, that has worked multiple times now. It has been a critical vulnerability, which is when I literally just put in credentials test, test, and I got it into <laughs> staging environments um, where like, people really do, like, I mean, everyone's a little lazy. Uh, I have put like tests and then mic test, and that's been fun. Like, yeah, or like test one, two, three, four. Uh, so there's hope out there. Um, yeah. One interesting thing that I found recently was an SQL injection in a landing page. Um, the fun fact about it is that um, with SQL map, the web application driver would block all of your attempts. So you would say, oh, okay, it's not viable. But if you try like the simple payload, it's like a piece of. Um, or 
So before we open it up to questions, if you were to tell your former pen tester self any advice on either how to get started or a lesson learned, what would that be? Um, I think what I would uh, kind of give advice to myself would be find an area that you like and just stick with it. Like I mentioned before, you're not going to be an expert in everything, but like if you like web application, then just focus on web application. If you like network security, just focus on that. Just find what you like and what you're passionate about and become an expert instead of just trying to be super general and learn everything. It, it pays off in the end for you and you have more fun. For example, I didn't know I liked IoT testing and that's usually what I do now. So just fact, find what you like and you know become the expert. There's plenty of jobs out there for everything. Uh, work with people who are 10 times smarter than you. And just watch everything they do. When I was younger, I thought that um, I need to master everything um, in order to be really good at my job. Um, I started to you know like the reverse engineering and the development, and I thought I wanted to be an expert in reverse engineering in order to be a great bed tester. But that's false because reverse engineering is an actual job in itself, and bed testing is like a separate job. So I don't have to know everything from all the jobs in the cyber security area because it's not possible. So I just focus on doing what I love. And the secret is everyone Googles. Like you don't have to know everything. <laughs> everyone just sets it up. Okay. Um, and one final question to you all before we transfer over to our lovely audience is what do we as individuals bring to the table? Um, is it collaboration? What is, what is one thing that you think that you really bring? Uh, as distinct from your peers. Go for it, Vanessa. <laughs> Stubbornness. Um, I think collaboration, uh, you know, I think as part of being pen testers, part of our job is also educating. Uh, I think we need to educate the people who we work with and just make sure that, you know, we are approachable, basically, and, you know, everyone might not know everything that you know, but just take the time and teach them and it's going to help you at the end because if they learn that thing, they won't come and ask me later on. Uh, so, yeah, just collaborate. Sorry. Um, yeah, also along the start of it, I think it's uh, trusting your gut. So a lot of times, at least for me, like when I, when I have a fresh pair of eyes on an API or a web app or, you know, looking at an external cloud perimeter, like sometimes you just you kind of get a sense. Um, and I think it's really useful to keep digging into that um, and, and not not dismiss or try to outlogic yourself. I think sometimes like you really can find um, unique ways of breaking into something by trusting your gut and continuing to push into it a little more. Um, and if you continue to do that, I think it, it's an iterative process. It's like a muscle where you sort of continue to practice it and, and that sense is really reaffirmed over time. So, yeah, we'll just add that. But you can't just say stubbornness and leave it as one word. You have to expand on that. I mean, is it stubbornness on focusing on that problem or stubbornness in what way? It's persistence. Yeah, it's, it's both. I think, I think it's both. I think, um, Stubbornness in terms of like when you identify that there's something there but you know you can go a little further, right? So not just saying like I'm gonna I'm gonna stick to you know this one minor I you know vulnerability, but I think there's something more going on here. I'm gonna keep pushing until I find it. Um, and I also think there's a little bit. I'll be frank here because this is the Diane initiative. Yeah. Um, I think there's also a lot of stubbornness that I have to use working with men sometimes. Um, where I really need to be very firm um, and not push back at when they're when they're second guessing or asking me something, and you you know you treat them with kindness, which you know, with kindness and respect. But like sometimes like they're wrong, uh, and I'm wrong too. So I'm not saying hey I'm the smartest person in the room, but you gotta be stubborn, and if you really trust your gut and you know 
that you're pursuing something that is um, on the right track. I think that's that's one way to go. I had uh, you know I was working on a pen test a while ago where there were multiple C surf issues and. Um, I had picked up on one little thing, and this guy was really pushing back on me and saying, like, what is this problem? Are you really finding anything? And it took me, like, continuously messaging him for days and, like, sending paragraphs upon paragraphs of, like, showing the code to really show him, like, hey, dude, like, there's multiple issues going on here. And you just can't, you got to start, you kind of just got to accept what you know and continue to push. And, um, you know, honor, honor your, your skill set. I will also say use a rubber ducky, and it works. Yeah. Not, not for hacking, but just bouncing out ideas sometimes kind of helps explain the problem and the solution just comes to you. Um, I think I can go back to the presentation of this. The location is key, so you have to uh, Carefully understand what the scope is. Are there any out of scope items or any business critical kind of flows that you need to be aware of? Uh, you need to check with your credentials that they are working uh, first before this is going to start. You know, need to save some time. So, yeah, communication is key with the clients and you have to be aware Thank you all. So, now the fun part begins. I hope you all have some questions. Uh, please. Okay. Um, so, I was wondering if you guys know about any like groups or, or at least the best ones and the best groups or forums where you could actually learn like how many people have the box together in person. Yeah, there's like a, like a nationwide chapter that are like a major city if it doesn't exist, if you can like start one. Um, and then virtual with like the Discord server or like the forum, something like that. Yeah. So as far as uh, like on-site uh, chapters, uh, OWASP, they have a lot of uh, local chapters. I know there's, uh, yeah, there's a lot. So just find, try to see if there's one in your community, uh, but that's definitely the first thing. The other thing that we're going to mention is, so SANS has, um, in this, it's for women, and basically this is an initiative to get women into security. So they're actually put you through a boot camp once you get accepted. So and they actually pay for all your certifications. So um, I don't remember the name on top of my head. I don't remember the name on top of my head, but we can post in the uh, right yeah. later. Um, I know that they send cohorts here to the Initiative and to Netcon, and it's amazing. Um, it's a really solid program. There's also a women in security privacy with what we the sponsor of DI. Uh, yes, purple too. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot, but definitely look into the SANS. It is you have to apply and get accepted. But I know a lot of people who don't have, and they you know have they found contesting jobs and or whatever they wanted to. But yeah, definitely look into that. Okay. Sure. Um, okay. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, apart from OWASP, are there any uh, pen testing guide that you would ref you would uh, recommend to refer while performing pen testing? And what are some tools you'd use apart from WorkSuite? Or SQL, uh, that's to speak for SQL injection. Uh, okay, it's a good book. Hattricks.xyz Hattricks .xyz is so good. Uh, highly recommended. Um, really, GitHub has some fantastic uh, recommendations. I, I actually reference them a lot for a API security because uh, OWASP doesn't have. You guys have seen any OWASP doesn't yeah. have like uh, they do. Yes, they do. They don't have like their top ten, but they don't yes. have like a yeah. solid API. Yes, yeah. yeah. They have yeah. for APIs. Not APIs, but. But for what? I'm saying for APIs though. Oh, okay. There's like a pretty solid, there's a pretty solid like kind of run bugs for APIs and REST APIs that I think are useful. Well. Okay. I will add also, and I think you guys get an accountant to that initiative, but a lot of the uh, no storage books. They're really great content. Uh, they're great. They have a lot of different ones. They have a API. They have uh, 
Yeah, we have a lot. I have like IoT, network security, like a whole bunch of books. I have, yeah. I think there's a discount, I believe. There is. Yeah. Um, I, I, don't, I don't remember how much, but there is. I think it's 30%. Yeah, check uh, in, in your emails and stuff. Yeah, okay. and there could be, I know they're in DevCon, so I'm sure you can find us with books there. But yeah, but it really depends on what areas you want to focus on. So even OWASP has a lot of different ones that's not just web. So they have IoT, they have mobile, they have the client, they have a lot of like. So OWASP is a great uh, resource, but I mean, like I said, it really depends on what you're trying to do. There's also, it's kind of older, but the web application handbook, that one's a really good one for, for that. So, um, yes. So what if you want to transition from web app make testing to mobile make testing? I understand we have iOS and Android, but you know, how to learn to jailbreak and form stuff? Do we have any, any channel, something that you would refer? Because uh, while, while you read a blog and implement things and while you watch, you know, video, yeah. it, it, I, I think it, uh, So Cybersecure Mentor, TCM, they have a course for mobile application, which is very helpful. Um, so I, I would say that's one of them to check out too. So who gets the goodies? We've had two questions All right, so far. let's see. <laughs> okay. We've had two good questions, so let's see. Pick a number in your head. Yes. Okay. You get to give a number first. So one, two, one, two, three. Pick a number. Okay. Wait, what's one to twenty. Pick a number. One to twenty. So we had a rubber ducky, and he said, "I can explain to you what he does." Or we have a hack by the court or in Berkeley. I have a rubber ducky. Would you like to take a number? <laughs> All right. You know what? Let's be generous. Here we go. <laughs> Alright, more questions? And would you like to take the heck back? It's a very important concept. I have this. Okay, yeah. What are the security keys? Do you have one? Uh, I, I had a question that was weird. You're asking about mobile hacking. Oh, yeah, that's right here. Well, did we have any other questions over here, though? Okay. Let, let's yeah. jump over here and then we'll. Sure. Hello, thank you so much for your panel today. It was so interesting to hear from your experiences. Uh, I just wanted to touch upon the scope and you know, understanding where you draw the line. I want you to understand if you have some instances on when the scope was breached or in bug bounty cases, the geopolitical issues and stuff. And can you say, shed some light on tips and tricks on how to you know, draw the boundary for us? And when we're doing the testing, we kind of actually get into a rabbit hole and Something's quite not be clear now, so anything that you guys can type for us, girls can type for us. My bad. So um, I can touch on it from more of a management perspective. Um, I am not a technical person, so I manage pen testing, pen testers. Um, and for us, the way that we are set up is we actually manage that part of it, right? Like if, you're, if the client comes to you, we have a Slack channel, and the client says, "Oh, by the way, uh, can you test this for that?" Or the one I get to say no, or the two cams that we work with get to say no. Um, but as a pen tester, do you want to comment how you're like, no? Well, like for pen testing, you have statements to work for rules of engagement. Make sure you follow them. Basically, if it's not fair, then don't do them because you're liable. And also, it's called scope creep. You're supposed to be charging more. So, yeah, if it's not specifically written in the same way of work, you just have to push back and be like, that's usually when we said, tell the TPMs, it's like, hey, you need to handle this. But, just basically, it's about setting the customer's expectations and saying that that's not really what you guys agreed on previously. Uh, yeah, so I think there's, there's a couple things. Scope is um, really tricky sometimes to get right because it's, for example, with a web app, it's never just a web app. Um, right now, we have like, there's probably three or four elements of scope for any web app that you're testing. You have the actual web application, you have the web hooks, the API, the external cloud perimeter. So, you know, you get questions, or I get questions sometimes where um, I'll find resources that, that point to um, their S3 buckets, but those S3 buckets are out of scope. So it's really tricky sometimes where, you know, you can communicate with them, but then you've got scope group. So the best thing that 
you can do is trust that you're, you're working with a team that is evaluating the scope of the client before you're, you're working with them. Um, and then also, you know, I think that it's really tricky that gets people hung up, especially by bounty, is wild card domains. So understanding how subdomains operate um, and whether or not you can actually access those subdomains and test them. So I think that's important. And then another thing that um, I find gets mixed up a lot is um, DOS is typically prohibited for testing for pen tests. And uh, the way that scanners work, they're very, very noisy. And if you're running in a staging environment or dev environment and you're running full scans against that target, I mean, I, I would argue that's DOS, depending on what controls they have in place. So there's a couple things you just really need to be aware of if you're, you know, especially if you're working in a staging environment um, and trying to run scans, because Honestly, I don't find a lot of success. I don't find a lot of stuff through running scans anyway. So, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's just like another thing to keep in mind in terms of you know reading the brief, because um, the brief is, is really you know it's it's the trust it's the trust and the bridge between you and the and the client. So, so one more thing: make sure you the client has permission to test that specific uh, thing, right? Like for example. Like we all heard in the news, right? The some employees were uh, tasked to do some physical assessment to a courthouse, and apparently the person who gave them permission didn't have the permission to give them permission, so they ended up in jail. So make sure you, and that's not only just physical security, just in general. Make sure you're testing first the right thing that they they uh, the scope, and also that you have permission, like whether it's it posted on AWS or anything else, you want to make sure you, they have permission to test it. I think that uh, sometimes you also have to be careful because some friends might come and say, oh, instead of three user roles, we actually want you guys to test five user roles, so they have something to add on this side of things. Um, and this adds up um, a lot of workload on the um, access control side of things, so um, you have to be really careful on what you initially agree with the client because this will impact the time as well that it needs to be I just have another question. There's another resource for like mobile hacking uh, like XDA developers, it's more like an open. Forum like Slack Exchange, and I don't I don't know how like well that is the people who post answers are. And I was wondering if you actually knew more about that forum and like can you fully trust the answers people are saying? And sometimes they also like post scripts, and it's like are right, those safe to download and run? And sometimes that was really the question, and also a burden for like. So, yeah. so <laughs> I think you need to be very careful what kind of scripts you you, you uh, run. Uh, we have seen that obviously there's malicious code sometimes there. I think that happened recently too. Um, but also, I I'm not sure about the specific forum, but I just kind of try to if I see it somewhere else, try to verify that someone else is saying the same thing. Basically, like for example. That for jailbreaking, there's a lot of different uh, jailbreaks, like uncover or something. Make sure that if, it's, if you download the exploit that you're downloading from the actual person who is uh, implemented it. So that's one of the things I would say. The other thing too is if you're looking for resources, especially Android, you know, you can go to their the Android developer site and they have a lot of uh, Information there on how it works. They're not going to tell you how to jailbreak it, but you know you can see like I know like I recently learned that apparently uh, Android is no longer recommending you to use certain name for mobile applications, and that's, that was kind of shocking to me. But apparently they're not anymore. Yeah. Um, so so yeah. So just you, and yeah, I found that from the Android development uh, documentation. Okay, nobody's asked it yet, so I have to try this one. 
Um, have you ever come across a pen test and the results were nothing? You found nothing. Yeah, so this is what you do, we, we tell us. That's a funny thing. <laughs> you said, we tell us. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because we, you know, especially like, you know, we tell us. It's such a low finding, but yes, there are times where you're grasping at a straw, basically, and that's okay. Sometimes you will find something that has no more abilities. Either the scope is very reduced, or sometimes it's very hard that it has gone through many cycles. So that is always the thing. So for us, at least in my team, uh, we actually have a storyboard section, which is, tells like how we tested it. And it's especially useful when you have one findings and the clients are like, what are you finding? So this is more of like how like show your work basically. So question. Yeah, so I just had a question for you guys. With the emerging technology, especially with chat GPT, do you guys use it as a way to create codes or scripts to use as part of your toolset? <laughs> uh, that's a loaded question, and uh, we should be able to put it here. So, it's a tool, right? Use it. There's nothing wrong with it as long as you're not putting any identifiable, identifiable information or any client information. Use it. Like, uh, there are like pen tests from GPT and out there, uh, but it's also really good for. Reporting. I mean, uh, you know, no one wants to write the reports. Obviously, there are some stuff that you don't want to enter into uh, customer data, but you can, like, if you have a, 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 a finding that you might not have, like, a description of, it's really good for that. Obviously, you need to make sure that it's accurate. Uh, but, um, yeah, I, I think we're going to see that AI is going to become more apparent and useful, and it's just about who's going to implement it. And, but at the end of the day, it is a tool. Do you think it's going to kill us all? No, I don't think that. <laughs> <laughs> um, have you ever seen a movie, Colossus the Foreman Project? The computer effects are very, very dated because it's 1970. But go watch it. It is not going to be happy and war gamey like you're going to go, oh shit, AI, no. <laughs> so yeah, go watch it. And I think I just want to go back to the point, your, to your question, actually, like, if you don't have findings, again, show your work. Like, we always tell our testers, document, 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 right? Because at the end of the day, you want to give the client a gold star. Like, if they did an amazing job, of course, you guys want to find things and you want to hack it all away. But at the end of the day, if you're able to give the client a gold star and you document your work, that's a win. It could be a win-win. Well, here's the reason I asked that question, and maybe you can elaborate on this. I, I work with a lot of third-party vendors, and we ask for pen tests. Um, we had a vendor give us the results of their pen test that was provided from some professional um, firm, and it said there were no findings, and all the ports, no open ports anywhere. And I looked, and I said, but there's open ports all over the place. Um, what's going on here? The, the fear I have is, is there are clients that are accepting these results from professional teams. Not yours, but some of these teams are like fly-by-nighty kind of um, Somebody ran a, an in-map scan, didn't find anything, and went away. So I think it's important that you're thorough. So I do think that sometimes, like, for example, you said you there were some open ports and they reported open ports, maybe there's a spray limiting, right? Something that they really just ran a vulnerability scanner, they got blocked by the lab, yeah. and that's it. And that's but that's not the whole story, right? Like that's why you have to use proxies and you have to use uh, you know, maybe if it's not coming back with anything open, then you know, change the end map to to a different uh, the speed that it runs it and then you can find stuff like it is also, besides there's other tools that end up, there's mask yes. there's, you can even hear this like, uh, I see like NetCat, whatever, take longer, but you can still do it, like there's a lot of tools out there, but also sometimes don't rely on tools, you know, you have to do manual work and all of this.
it's something that's on this, I'll try to make sure. Uh, there's a way that vendors can hack the system, which is by <laughs> uh, by reducing the scope dramatically and doing black box black box tests and not providing credentials. So it's super simple to have no findings. If you're like, hey, I want you to uh, bypass this URL that you have to access through the VPN, but we're not going to provide you a VPN, right? No findings. Um, or they don't give you any information and no credentials, and they want you to hack into a um, a you know a web application, but the authentication mechanism is OAuth through Google, and that's not a scope. You subsequently have zero findings. So um, it's a little. Um, if you're if you're working on a pen test and in good faith you're working on a web app and there's no findings, I think that's that's great, right? It's a hard application. If you're and this has happened before. Or I'm working with a client and you know they they want to clean pen tests, but they're not willing to remediate the vulnerabilities or really allow someone to dive in deep because they don't trust the pen testers. That's a that's a kind of situation that's not ideal. And for you, right, when you're looking at that pen test, you're like something is oh, yeah. off. Yeah. Um, so it's just it's about trust. I mean pen testing is literally about trust. Um, and you know, like with the really with the scope, like I, I really do consider it uh, an honor when companies are like, we are going to give you permission to look into our infrastructure because they really are sometimes giving us the keys to their kingdom. Um, and so, you know, I think it, that trust is reciprocal, it goes both ways. Um, and if we can build a healthy relationship and work together, it's a great partnership. If they don't trust the pen testers or the hackers, um, no one wins in that situation, including that company's customers who also deserve due diligence for the data that they are giving to that company. So, yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on that. Do you have one question at the back? Yeah, more of a comment. Uh, yeah, so I think that the customers that are kind of vague and they really don't understand what, they're, what you're asking from them, and that's why the reports come out so bad. And some of them are because of compliance issues, right? There's a pen testing that needs to be done or to comply with something. Uh, how do you guys deal with that? Do you guys help the customer understand hey, what you're requesting, what the information you're providing it doesn't make sense if there's somebody else on the team that does understand the infrastructure? Sometimes if it's a really small company, right? Like if you're working with a seed startup or Series A, like they're not they're not gonna have um, they're not gonna have uh, you know, vice president of information security or a CISO or a security engineer. Like, they're running by the bootstraps and they might need to get a pen test done because they're trying to sell their service to another company that's requiring it, right? So, at that point, like, you you also, like, if you're that customer, you want to trust the company that you're working with, um, you know, whether it's a company like Cobalt or another one, to kind of advise you and help you with the scope so that you know what you're doing because, yeah, there are definitely times when. I'll be working with someone who's a developer, right? And you know, it's the first time launching a, a pen test, so um, it happens. And it's not, it's no one's fault. But I mean, I think it's great. Like it's great. If they need to run, if they need to get a pen test done so that they can help close a deal, like fuck yeah, you know, let's do it. Let's get that report out for you. But just we gotta keep sure you're right. I think also you kind of need to explain it to them, right? So if they hear buzzwords and they don't really understand them. So for example, black box, right? So it's great to have black box testing, but sometimes maybe 